Dear fellow members of the Swiss Chamber of Singapore, dear partners, dear speakers, a warm welcome from us, the organizers of the Economic Outlook 2021. Um, for all those I didn't have the chance yet, um, a very good new year, stay health and hopefully getting back to a bit new normal. So that certainly should be a bit the topic of today's economic outlook. We want to discuss about what 2021 will bring to us from an economic perspective. We will strive a couple of interesting themes uh, together with our experts. And I'm very, very proud that we achieved to have a high uh, expertise panel today in order to serve you with um, uh, some interesting and maybe as well a bit contradiction uh, opinions to the actual situation and uh, how the markets uh, will react this year. Um, we just, as an introduction, we're gonna start with a, with a speech afterwards uh, uh, of Rajiv de Mello. Rajiv de Mello is uh, the managing director of Deep Learning Investments. Um, before, um, he used to be the uh, chief investment officer of Bank of Singapore. Today, he is the chief investment officer for many companies. Um, Afterwards, we will have a panel beside Rajiv. Uh, we will have as well um, our Swiss National Bank represented by the head of the Singapore branch, um, Marco Huwiler. Then we will have UBS uh, represented uh, with Hartmut Issel. He is the head of equity for um, APAC at UBS. Uh, then we will have the Chief Investment Officer for uh, APAC of Lombard Odier, uh, Jean-Louis Nakamura as well. So that is the panel afterwards where we will address some questions which we prepared, but uh, you are very welcome as well to raise the one or, or the other topic you are interested in. Um, that said, I don't want to lose too much time since there's a lot to discuss in this um, hour we have uh, together. And, and I just hand over to Rajiv to start with his uh, personal look to the market and the economic environment. Please, Rajiv. Well, thank you very much Georg, for that uh, introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending uh, our, our afternoon uh, today. Uh, it's a great honor to be able to share with you my views initially and then the panel discussion later on. So I'm going to um, show you some slides. I'm just going to put that on, sorry. So is that, uh, is that clear? Can you see my slides? Yes, yep. we can see them. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this is an outlook for, for 2021. And I think it's a very exciting uh, time to be doing an outlook after the absolutely extraordinary year that we've had um, in 2020. Um, to be very, to take a top line view on, on um, the 15 minutes that I'm going to talk to you, I want to address a couple of points. One is that global economy able to recover from this recession. Two, what are policymakers doing to support the economy and activity? And three, why are financial markets so optimistic as we've seen in the last months and most recently in the last few weeks? What are the implications for Asia? Uh, our region where we are all based. And then how will that impact uh, Singapore as well? And then a wrap up of the, of the conclusions. So to start with, um, these, I wanted to turn to the recovery itself. So generally, um, there is a large consensus that we're going to have a very strong recovery. Uh, JP Morgan, to take a an experienced economics team as, a, as an example, 
expects a global rebound to 5.8% th this year after a contraction of 3.8% in 2020. That's a 9.6% swing in growth and that's absolutely huge. And that acceleration of growth will really materialize itself in the second quarter. Now, what we have seen is the increase in the COVID cases uh, and unfortunately deaths is retarding this recovery. Winter, weather, Christmas, New Year, and new variants have all contributed to the increase in cases and therefore governments have started to lock down again. And in this slide, what you see is that um, an estimate of the growth impact of these lockdowns, an estimate done by Goldman Sachs. And what you see is in April, uh, there was a minus 20% impact on global GDP because of the amplitude of the lockdowns. That of course fell and the break of the lockdowns reduced as the slide, as the line goes up, the blue line, until October. And then from October, we saw these renewed lockdowns and now we're seeing a break on growth once again. Now, what does that mean in terms of the distribution of growth? Well, it means that the countries which are imposing less lockdowns because they're seeing less cases are doing relatively better. And we see that on the left-hand side in the green bars, it's generally in Asia. We see Taiwan, China, Vietnam, countries which actually will suffer a bit because there's these bars show that there is going to be a hit to Q4 GDP, but definitely much less than what we see on, in the red on the right-hand side of the chart. Spain, the UK, France and Italy, Germany, quite significant impacts to growth on the fourth quarter. Now that is the problem that we face starting of the year, these lockdowns. But there is another aspect which gives a lot of freedom to governments and central banks is the fact that inflation worldwide has been so low and has been low for long. And that's important because when we look at what an inflation target of a central bank like the US Fed is 2% on this line here in this blue line, and we see where we are in the gray line, we see we're way below this target. And that would be a similar picture for the ECB, for the Bank of Japan, for the Swiss National Bank, for any central bank, is below their inflation target. So that's actually very good because it gives uh, policymakers a room to maneuver, to, to cushion uh, the impact of these lockdowns. Now, what we're seeing also is a gradual increase in inflation expectations. And of course, that is uh, good from the central bank perspective. The central banks would like to have inflation a bit higher than it is. They're more worried these days about low inflation than about high inflation. We see it's working in the US in the light blue line on the top of the chart, but there's not much impact on inflation expectations, the line at the bottom, which is Japan. So these expectations uh, and this low inflation uh, are something that we need to think about because as long as around the 2%, it's okay for the case of the states, but if it's much below, uh, it could be a bit of concern. Now, one of the things, one of the policies which was implemented which really supported the economy, households, poorer people, and the markets has been this tremendous fiscal response. And in this chart, which comes from the IMF uh, in October, we see that as of mid-September last year, the amplitude, the magnitude of this fiscal expansion has been truly enormous. On the right-hand side, we see New Zealand and Singapore and Canada, countries which have seen a huge fiscal expansion. But since September, when this chart was published, it was published in October, but since then, we've seen also further boosts by the US, most recently in end December, by the European Union and by Japan as well. So we see a huge fiscal expansion, something which we haven't seen for years, for decades, in fact. In the US, we're expecting a new plan of the Democrats, even more than the 900 billion that we heard, heard about at the end of December. And we're also expecting um, big expansions in, um, in Europe, 
And Japan also has announced further expansion as well of, uh, of uh, fiscal policy. Now on the other side, monetary policy was very, very quick to, uh, to be implemented. Back in March, we already saw quite a significant increase in balance sheets by central banks. And in this chart, what we see is we see that these, these balance sheets have been increasing for during after the global financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, you see a little bump. But the bump that we see right now, or just now, has been much larger. I mean, that's what has really been extraordinary and comes from every central bank around the world. Now that, of course, has had a tremendous impact on financial markets. So we had both the impact of uh, the fiscal policies, the impact of monetary policies, and that's had an impact on the different asset classes, which I show here on this bar chart. On the left-hand side, we see technology, which is really the first to, uh, to rally uh, because of the work from home. It made a lot of sense. People had to buy different equipment and companies as well. And InfoTech really did extremely well. But then it spread further on. And we see emerging markets there in the middle, the S&P 500, the broad US index, and a lot of different asset classes really do extremely well during the year. The laggards on the right-hand side you see is oil and energy, which of course are very linked to the problems that we've had with travel, transport, et cetera. Now what's truly been amazing is the rally in the NASDAQ. And there we see, I wanted to show you this chart because even the fall that we had in March and April has been completely reversed and we've taken out these new highs. Now global equities in this chart, and here I've you know, tagged end of March as a low point, are up 64%. One can see that from this, uh, from this graph here. So truly remarkable recovery in global equities. So beyond just um, technology. Now, if we look uh, at this next chart, we see the increase in profits. And I show this because sometimes people wonder whether we're just not in a huge bubble. Well, profits have been increasing. They decreased during the crisis, um, but they have been an upward trend. Uh, so we do have some fundamental reasons to see stocks going up over the many years. However, what we see from this chart is on many traditional metrics, stocks do look expensive. We see here on the top chart, the S&P 500, capitalization as a percentage of US GDP, 150%, much higher than it was during the 2000 bubble. Uh, and we see the S&P against world GDP as well. And we see that it's there close to where it was in that infamous 2000 bubble. Now, moving on to bonds, we've seen a tremendous decrease in bond yields uh, since the beginning of 2019. Uh, and 2020, a sharp fall, especially when uh, the, um, the pandemic started. And now since the month of August, we've seen a gradual increase in, uh, in yields. And more recently in the last few days, seen a sharper increase, a breach of that 1% on the US 10 year yield, which has made some investors nervous, especially since one of the reasons why equities have done so well is that there was very little alternative Bonds were yielding so little. So if bond yields are coming back, will that change? I think it's a bit too early. I don't think anybody's going to get too excited at 1%, but it's just this degree and the speed of increase which worry people. Now turning to the dollar, here yeah, I'm showing the dollar against a broad index of uh, counterparties since 2000. And what we see is the dollar has fallen quite significantly uh, since March. The dollar is a type of currency which tends to do badly when global growth takes off because capital then flows from the US to the rest of the world. And that is a challenge to the dollar. And we've seen that in effect here, a weakening of the dollar. Another reason for the dollar's weakness is the Fed has been very easy, as I mentioned, on monetary policy. And that means that plenty of dollars flooding the system, which means the dollar has declined. Now, what are the implications for Asia? And I think that since we're here, this is a big, it's a big topic. The first one is really that China has seen an amazing V-shaped recovery. 
It went into its lockdown on the 26th of January last year, and it came out or started coming out two months later. And we see here on this chart, the tremendous performance of the Chinese economy. The range of expectations for 2021 are between five and 8%, uh, so quite high. Um, and when we compare what an 8% would be, I mean, there's some forecasters even calling for 10, uh, that is a very, very strong recovery. And that's very important for the rest of Asia as well, as China is a big destination for a lot of our exports from the region, a lot of the destination for global exports as well. But China is exporting also a lot. And here we see the trade balance of China in the blue line going up quite sharply on the back of the fact that a lot of consumers switched from services, holidays, travel, hotel, restaurants, to buying goods, a fair amount of technology goods, which China produces as well or assembles, um, and all kinds of other goods. And on the other side, Chinese tourists dried up. They didn't travel anymore. So that also contributed to the current account balance moving in China's favor. Turning to Korea, Korea has also seen a significant recovery. In the blue line, we see the sentiment of businesses. That's gone up very sharply. Many of the same reasons as China, um, a demand for technology, a demand for goods, which Korea produces. And we've seen the manufacturing output in the orange line go up very significantly. Now let's turn closer to Singapore, to Indonesia. And here I'm showing you the, the business confidence. That's gone up. Um, it's bound, rebounded quite sharply, despite the increase in virus cases that we all hear about. So Indonesia is seeing an increase in virus cases, but business confidence is recovering quite sharply. What does that mean for Singapore? Well, business is showing a V-shaped recovery in Singapore that we are, that we are seeing. Um, what is um, a positive for Singapore is, of course, the recovery in China. Uh, the recovery in the rest of Asia as well. The fact that interest rates are very low, yields on bonds extremely low in, uh, in Singapore. The government has been implementing huge fiscal policy. We saw that from the first chart. What's more difficult for Singapore is the labor situation with unemployment higher, quite a lot of loss of jobs, and also tourism, which is an important sector of Singapore, also being weakened by the lack of travel. And that's, that's something which is important. Singapore is very sensitive to global growth and to exports to Europe and the US. So if the, these cases that we're seeing continues to keep the lockdowns in uh, Q1, it's going to be a bit difficult for Singapore. Yet by Q2, we should see a much faster recovery. So to recap, before we go to the panel, I think the global economy will continue to recover from the second quarter onwards. Q1 might be a bit more difficult the massive policy stimulus and the expectations around controlling the virus thanks to the vaccine and other means have kept confidence high. Analysts and economists, strategists are looking past Q1, past COVID into what's gonna happen afterwards, a very strong recovery. So financial markets can rise further. I expect further bullish moves. As they anticipate a period of rebuilding, a catch up in household and business spending, the pent up demand of many of consumers' wishes and to purchase and to travel being released will be very positive for the economy uh, from the second quarter onwards. China is leading Asia in a V-shaped recovery. Uh, China's growth will be strong in Q1, perhaps much unlike many other countries which are suffering from a second wave. Uh, then China might moderate in growth from Q2, but will still have a very strong uh, full year, as I mentioned. Singapore will recover more strongly after a challenging uh, Q1, but we're definitely on the way up. I'm quite an optimist for 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Rajiv. Your optimism, I think that's uh, the word as well, which we used in the outlook for, for uh, the new year from a Swiss Chamber perspective. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting insights um, to warm up our session. Um, dear members, now we enter into a panel discussion and um, 
I have prepared some questions, so I'll be uh, your moderator um, for the next uh, three quarters of an hour. And, uh, but you are very welcome as well to address um, some uh, uh, topics or questions you would like to address. Um, we certainly gonna discuss a bit about this recovery thing. I think that is something which is very, very important. And uh, uh, I want to know as well a bit from, from the audience, uh, from our panelists, how they see that if we have a completely common uh, opinion which is going in a way in a certain to a certain extent and not everywhere same uh, we will have to talk about inflation i think it's quite interesting since inflation seems to come back was long time now no um, no topic at all but uh, now obviously um, we are starting discussing that so what does that mean and um, as well in terms of interest rates, because interest rates at the end of the day are very linked to the inflation or inflation expectations. Uh, many of our members, companies, um, investors uh, do have to take um, um, as well decision when it comes to interest rates. So I want to raise that. And certainly as well, very important for all of us in a way or in the other is the development of China. China um, um, what do we expect from there, from that region? So that's certainly as well a topic. So these are the ones which I will raise, but uh, as I said, you're invited to um, uh, address as well some questions if you have. So let's start with this recovery scenario. So that seems to be, and everywhere we read papers and we hear uh, two speeches, it, it seems to be there is kind of a recovery to a certain extent. There are common scenarios. It seems that um, most of the economics uh, um, are uh, to agree on that. So let's challenge that as well a bit in our discussion. And, and uh, I want to know a bit maybe uh, and start off with, with, uh, with Jean-Louis. Uh, Sholui Nakamura, um, how do you, do you agree with that scenario? Do we maybe expect kind of a, um, um, a recovery to a certain extent? With, with the principle of a recovery, for sure, yes, we do agree and we support that view. To us, the question is more whether, well, actually, when this recovery will start to take place and how strong it will be. Uh, about when uh, Rajiv just expressed the idea, which which was the consensus and also our view at the very end of last year that it should take place in the second quarter of this year. But the fact is that since the start of 2021, we have seen a kind of tug of war between an acceleration in the number of cases, in the COVID cases, especially in, in Europe, in the US, but also in some uh, emerging countries, Brazil, South Africa, and also to some extent in some Asian countries, while at much lower extent, and also tug of war between renewed uh, COVID cases and the vaccination programs, which have been a bit chaotic at the start, which are accelerating a little bit now, but still very slow, um, and the policy, the prospect of policy stimulus. So for the time being, when you look at this kind of race between the different elements, you have the feeling that the virus is winning. Uh, I think this perception will change in the coming weeks because the acceleration programs, which have been chaotic because mostly because of logistic constraints, will accelerate significantly, especially after the approval and the deployment of the AstraZeneca vaccine. So probably by mid-February in the US, in the UK, probably by March in continental Europe. So, but there's still, still there is a risk that the first quarter will be quite depressed uh, in the US in UK in particular, in continental Europe, with some risk of spillover negative effect on the second quarter in terms of growth. So maybe, maybe the recovery will be a bit delayed and will take place more at the very end of the second quarter, the beginning of the summer, than in the second quarter as we might have foreseen a few weeks or a few months uh, ago. Then the question of the strengths of the recovery, which is much more important to some extent for the market because they are looking forward. And the fact is that we have a weak first quarter with some risk of negative spillover over the second quarter will fuel more policy stimulus as we have seen and with the prospect of the US doing more after what happened in Georgia last week. Uh, and, and it will help to, 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 to add uh, more fuel to the strengths of the recovery because all the cash and the checks which are drawn in favor of household will not be consumed immediately, but will be also consumed later when the economy will be open again uh, again further 
And then uh, it might fuel a very strong recovery, even stronger than what we had in mind also a few weeks ago. So it will lead to other kind of risk, but probably later this year is that if the recovery is very strong, if um, cyclical reflation in, is a bit stronger than what we had in mind a few weeks or a few months ago, if people start to believe that it's a, a persistent trend, they will start to raise questions about the persistence of economic policies, which have been, as explained by Rajiv, the main driver of the market for a few months. And then there might be more volatility in the market later in the year. But for the time being, market are forward looking, they are expecting their recovery, they are right. The recovery might be delayed a little bit, but it will be very strong and it will justify further improvement in earnings and also uh, uh, um, in, in price of uh, risky assets, so cyclical mm -hmm. sectors and industrials and materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me just uh, here uh, jump in with a question of, uh, of uh, uh, Tim Wiering, uh, Tim Wiering uh, we, uh, who uh, is asking something which I think is quite interesting in that, uh, in that relation. So everybody's talking about vaccine and so that is, that is a, um, um, let's say that's what we need for that recovery. But he's asking how much is the economic recovery dependent on the capabilities of innovate? What are the biggest drivers of innovation? And what is the perspective from a finance uh, uh, community? So uh, what role will innovation play? You want me Maybe. to answer first or? Okay. Whoever. Um, maybe I'll kick off with, with, with a thought on, on the vaccines. I mean, yes, uh, of course the vaccines would, would uh, make the base for the recovery uh, certainly stronger. However, uh, extending on, on what John already mentioned, we have to remember the, the dynamics of, you know, what, what actually caused the recession in the first place. I mean, yes, it was in a, in a, in a way COVID and the, the case numbers, but really what, uh, what drove it then is the, the response by authorities, right? So, so if, if a country, as we have seen in many places, the country is completely locked down for two or three months, every month you do that costs you as a rule of thumb, costs you about three percentage points of your GDP. So if you, if you lock down for an, for an entire quarter, this strictly, it costs you nine to 10 percent and then we, we have seen it and no country not even the richest not even singapore the us or european countries nobody can afford this uh, anymore so what we're seeing now is that despite the rising cases and yes we we are seeing lockdowns in some places um but the lockdowns are not as strict as they were uh, about nine months ago so, so you know also to, to um support a bit further the, the view that you know, we uh, portrayed here um, you, you, you get a recovery in any case, right? You can argue about the, the strength of it, but you, you do get that recovery. Now, uh, what helps us in terms of innovation? I mean, a very interesting angle that, that we saw happening very much, uh, I'd say certainly in, the, in, the, in, uh, in Europe, um, recently also in China, the US is uh, still a bit more open question is that um, recovery and innovation get linked via, via emergency programs, stimulus programs, that are tied, being tied to, I call it green tech or call it, you know, sustainable uh, um, energy production and, and, and all, all that supply chains, right? So, so the governments realize, yes, we do need to spend a lot of money, but we shouldn't, unlike after the financial crisis, we shouldn't just uh, only throw money at it, uh, regardless of, of what, you know, of, or, or we basically, we need targets, right? So the target is, let's also, to make the economies more, more future-proof, so, so basically create jobs that can sustain themselves in, in, um, in, in green technologies. We have seen, just give an example, in, in, in Europe, for example, it used to be that um, the governments you know, would spend on cars, especially the big car-producing countries, they would, they would uh, give subsidies. Um, they no longer do that, right? Unless you buy at least a, a hybrid, if, if not a full electric vehicle, but for a regular ICE or you know, internal combustion engine, do not get that anymore. So, so the, you know, also from that point of view, you know, other than digitization and work from home, there is a you know a lot of money is flowing uh, and and connecting connecting stimulus with these future jobs and the innovation. Mm. Thank you. So we know so innovation is necessary. That's what we're saying, and as well, that will be fostered from 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 governance as well. So that is uh, that is uh, um, and in in in, uh, in a perspective of financial markets, maybe just to close that. So what what is the perspective from a finance uh, finance community? 
So, uh, so or that is probably that. So we are finance community, and that is our pr um, uh, perspective. So hopefully that answers your question, Tim. Thank you very much for that. Um, so any anything else uh, uh, somebody wants to share about uh, this recovery? Some other uh, thoughts? So it seems yes, I can be... maybe mm -hmm. add a few comments from from my side. So thank you first, Rachi, for this very interesting presentation. And I think many of the points you mentioned are also reflected in in our baseline. Uh, scenario. So this scenario is also um, based on the assumption that, that the pandemic will be brought back under control and that appropriate measures, including the vaccination programs, will prevent further waves of infection. And also an important support to demand, as you mentioned, is of course monitoring fiscal policy. And uh, I think so one one uh, thing you mentioned is also, I think, very important that we will maybe see later this year um, a period of time where growth rates will be above potential. And you mentioned these forecasts, and uh, this is also that seem to be very high, but much of it is is um, driven by pent up demand, I would say. Um, the consumer side, and, uh, the capital formation sides will be relevant in this respect. I think one thing that also is, has to be must be seen is that many economies, even after this year, if it's so positive as you as you explained, many economies will not be um, at GDP levels they have seen before the pandemic, maybe towards the end of the year. One exception is China. China has already, um, reach the GDP level in uh, Q3. So in China, we can see a complete uh, V-shaped recovery. In terms of risks, I, I would say this is more or less what we are seeing. So the, the major risk, both on the positive and the negative side, lies in the progress of vac vaccination uh, programs. If it turns out that the proved vaccines are less, e less effective, especially uh, against the new variants of the virus, this could worsen the outlook. And it goes without saying that this would also put the damper on market uh, sentiment. But predicting the future path of, of COVID is, is very difficult. And I, I would leave that uh, to the experts. Yeah. However, one observation I, I would like to make is that the risk associated with the pandemic has also evolved over the past year. So at the very beginning, one year ago, it was an unknown unknown. Then mm. later last year, maybe in the second half, it became a known unknown. And in the meanwhile, meanwhile I would say it's rather a, a known known for, for most of us. Yeah. Thank you very much for that uh, perspective uh, uh, from from uh, from a Swiss national uh, point, a Swiss national bank point of view. Uh, maybe there's uh, quite an interesting question, and afterwards I wanna I wanna leave uh, this recovery topic, but uh, I wanna have answered that as well um, from Sasha, and he come Sasha Fools who who, uh, who asks us um, with relation to Tim's question about innovation, was it the mistake for governments to subsidize salary? instead of incomes. I know um, uh, to whom I may address this uh, question, maybe Rajiv. I, I think governments um, acted on what they could implement the fastest and different countries rolled out different measures to cushion uh, people who couldn't get any more income from, uh, from work. So the European approach was to subsidize salaries to keep people attached to the labor market and not lose their skills. And the American approach was to send uh, checks, uh, but people were still laid off. So two, two very different approaches. I know I'm not exactly answering your question, but we will see later on which one was more effective. Right now we're seeing a, we've seen an increase in job creation in the US 
of course, less in Europe because less people left because of the, the subsidies. But I think it's too early to tell which one because the hardship needs to be immediately addressed for people who could not work because of the, of the, uh, the disease. And maybe as well with this unknown factor, which we just heard before, which is as well something government has um, um, firstly to react, obviously. Okay, so thank you very much for these uh, views on, on, on the recovery. Um, and so I have, we have other questions already. So one is uh, concerning the US dollar. We will come back to that um, uh, when we talk about inflation and interest rates. Uh, we have as well uh, some question about US, uh, which coming in with the new administration. That's also something I noted. We, if you agree to take that up when we are talking about China uh, as well. So let me um, uh, come to the inflation. So I think that's an interesting one because since uh, um, uh, Fed started uh, to discuss about that topic, uh, I, I think in the late summer months, by changing their strategy, how they're going to control uh, the inflation uh, going forward. So that, for me, was kind of a trigger uh, when, when everybody started again to discuss about that, that phenomenon. And even though that everybody talks about that inflation in short term is not a topic, and we saw that uh, from, from your uh, graphs as well, Rajiv, uh, um, so we didn't um, reach those inflation targets at all. So everybody starts to discuss about that. Um, and maybe, Rajiv, just to engage you on that now again, can you explain to us what FED is changing? So why is that uh, of, a, of an importance? And, and maybe then as well, um, uh, answer the question um, from, um, from, I don't see who is asking it, but uh, um, you mentioned weakening US dollar when other regions take off, uh, so take off maybe as well in terms of inflation after additional stimulus on the Biden, do we expect the dollar to strengthen again? So maybe to um, explain uh, quickly and then uh, as well what, what the influence of the dollar is, please. Sure, I mean the, 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 the central banks, the Fed and the ECB were targeting a 2% inflation rate. Now, as you saw from my earlier chart, they didn't hardly ever reached it, or I showed it on the Fed. Now they've shifted to saying, we're not targeting 2% at one point, but we're targeting an average of 2%. So if we undershoot 2% for a couple of years, we're okay if inflation goes above 2% for a couple of years, so the average sort of gets to 2%. They're not being very specific on how many months, years, whatever but they are going to tolerate inflation being higher than their target for a little while. And that's quite a difference because that means that even if inflation does go up above 2% to 2.5%, two let's say, they would still not increase interest rates or talk about buying less bonds. Uh, so they're going to be much more patient than coming out of the global financial crisis if they apply their new methodology, which I think they will. So that's on the inflation side. On the dollar, the stimulus, I, I think the, the question is an extremely good one. Additional US stimulus of the magnitude talked about in addition to the 900 billion, which was announced in December, uh, could definitely propel the US economy to be even stronger. Then we have to see how does it impact the currency? So on the one hand, as I mentioned, all the globe is doing better capital flow to the US. And the US tends to be a safe haven currency as well. So when things go bad, money goes back. When things are good, money flows out. But there's also the other effect. There's if US interest rates go up and bond yields go up, like we've seen in the last week, the dollar tends to get a little bit of a bid because there's a higher return in the US than in Euro, in, in Europe, Eurozone, or in Japan. So it's good to have a little bit more yield in the States. Um, so there, there could be a little bit of that. However, there's, there are hedging mechanisms uh, and there's a larger deficit to finance in the US. I think net net, we'll still see a dollar which weakens a bit, but it already weakened a lot, as you saw from my chart. So I don't expect it to 
to continue at that same pace of weakening. And we probably establish some kind of range because all the other central banks also have to do the same thing as the Fed. Um, and so it's difficult to see um, the a difference in monetary policy between the major central banks in the world. Georg? Thank you. I, yeah, sure. Yeah, if I may jump in, because I think it's a, the, the inflation subject and the dollar are subject, of course, but the inflation subject in particular is, are, is very a key, a key topic for this year. It's probably the main risk to me, not in terms of actual inflation developments, because as explained by Rajiv, we are starting from very low. There will be some reflection, which is perfectly legitimate in the context of a full recovery, especially if this recovery is pretty strong. But the main risk is, again, as I said before, for some investors not to properly understand what this average inflation target in new regime means. And it has been very clearly explained by Rajiv, but you know, um, if investors continue to look at inflation on an ongoing basis, at current inflation on an ongoing basis, when inflation will start to pick up, even if it's 2% in the US, 1.2, 1.3 in Europe, and climbing above 2%, they might start to think that the Fed will be in position to tighten its monetary policy. And this is where we need the FOMC to be extremely clear in its guidance about the fact that, no, it won't. And that's funny because Last week, we had the minute of the December meeting for the FMC. And when you read the minutes, frankly speaking, it was not that clear. And it gave the impression that the intellectual consensus around this uh, inflation average inflation targeting regime was not that strong. And we had to wait for yesterday, actually overnight, uh, Mrs. Esther George, which is one of the most hawkish members of the FMC, which we had to, uh, to, to make a public statement to say, OK, we will be patient anyway. Uh, to see the reversal in the in the recent uh, move in long-term interest rate in the U.S. with a 10-year Treasury yield losing almost four basis points overnight from uh, 118 to 1, uh, 112, 111. So it's just an illustration, among many other, that the FOMC this year will have to be extremely clear in its guidance about what this average inflation targeting regime means and that they will not react to ongoing pickup in inflation rates, because if they don't do the job properly, then we might again face some volatilities in the market, given the sensitivity of the stock market to the level of interest rates. And to make the connection with the dollar, the overall objective of the Fed is also to keep real interest rates as low and ideally as negative as possible. And, 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 and that's one of the reasons why uh, dollar will also uh, uh, be under pressure to depreciate further. I agree with Rajiv, probably not at the same pace as what we have seen between March and December last year, but still there's still some room, especially in front of emerging currency, probably more than in front of the other G10, uh, G10 currencies. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's a, a, a pretty clear statement. Um, I don't know if, if uh, um, from a central bank uh, perspective, uh, Marco, you want to mm -hmm. say something? Yeah, well? sure. So uh, inflation is always a very exciting topic, especially for a central banker. And, and I think I have few, a few thoughts. First of all, this question of whether the long period of disinflation is coming to an end soon. This is fundamentally important for not only for investors, but also for central banks, of course. So maybe a few thoughts on this more structural topic of uh, low inflation and are we now at the turning point? So in the past two decades, one important disinflationary force has been the integration of China into the global economy. After China joined the WTO in 2001, and another important force has been the internet and the impact of new tech companies such as Google and Amazon. These companies enable price sensitive consumers to compare prices and to reduce mm -hmm. the pricing power of producers or they, or they cut out the middleman in the supply chain and lower price margins. So is this process continuing or is it coming to an end? So this key question is difficult to answer because we don't know whether these effects are going to be repeated or whether they are uh, petering out. Another topic maybe that, uh, is relevant to both markets and the central bank 
is the question of supply chains. So prior to the pandemic, for many companies, the price and quality were the most important considerations when building their supply chains. And since the pandemic, it looks like many companies are now moving to a world where security of delivery is more important, even if the cost is higher. This develop development is likely to be accompanied by a decline in productivity. So I think these are the structural, more longer term forces. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to have the right answer to these key mm -hmm. questions, because generally it is almost impossible to identify structural breaks and changing trends in the economy in real time. So I think what we have to accept is that only history will tell us, only when we have a sufficient database is we can analyze and assess such developments uh, with, with precision. On a, more on a more cyclical basis, I think what, what you mentioned is also that we, we are in a recession or many economies are in a recession, they're recovering and the cyclical component of inflation is very low. And it will take some time until what we call the output cap is closing and the labor market is improving and we can have more pressure from the wages and prices. And maybe one final uh, remark on inflation expectations, uh, something you showed in, in your presentation, Raj, is Yes, this is true. We have seen this uptick in inflation expectations or to be precise in break even inflation rates, but there are also other indicators of inflation expectations and inflation expectations is nothing we can observe. We need some indicators that give us an idea what inflation expectations look like and other indicators that are come from surveys uh, with uh, with households or businesses don't show this this increase yet and so i think we have to be careful when we say that inflation expectations are now um, breaking out and and, and going up and uh, well, maybe markets as we know can also um, mm -hmm. just be get wrong. ahead of themselves from time to time yeah so um, um, when I listen to you, so that means inflation, it's not a real, a real concern actually. So that would mean as well uh, on the interest rate uh, um, a situation, maybe markets are already a bit ahead of the time when we saw that uh, interest rates uh, are going up. So we saw that in, um, as in, in the example of uh, Rothschild and the US uh, Treasury yield. Um, but anyway, just uh, uh, to, to, uh, to sum up there on, on, on that uh, topic and to bring in the interest rate uh, perspective, Hartmut, what do, does UBS uh, recommend to the, uh, to the clients? Should companies, SMEs, uh, who do have credit, should they now fix the rates in the long term, just in, in order not having this exposure of uh, um, uh, having higher credit costs going forward? We're probably a bit out of consensus in a sense that uh, I think many houses expect uh, at, at least uh, uh, to some degree the, the ten year the ten years in the u s to to come up a bit further we we, we don't necessarily and in fact we even for the end of the year we have about uh, one percentage points for the ten years so um maybe a bit lower than consensus and um if, if that's the case so yeah probably probably um yeah no no need to fear that 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 anything is is rising in the the near term. Um, having said that, if, if I may, I already saw a couple of, of uh, questions on in China. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, many, many of our uh, audience here, our friends from the Swiss Gym are, are entrepreneurs and, and thought maybe sh uh, share something that we have talked about in you know, probably the last two years already since this, this uh, Paris became a, became a hot topic. Um, we have just done a pretty much in-depth uh, study because we, we do notice and of course that you know some of the supply chain or parts of them they go to other countries especially india and and, and uh, vietnam as we had laid out i think about six or 12 months ago also the swiss gem right they, they they benefit from that but to put it a bit in perspective uh, it, because it seems sometimes uh, in recent uh, months that it gets a bit overblown perhaps right? because on one side the argument is yeah maybe wages in china are about three times at least right, what they are in in, in india for example 
but we have done analysis of many manufacturing products and we, we come to the conclusion that that by and large uh, you know these other countries are maybe slightly to the tune of five percent cheaper but um, if, if you do uh, also allow to, to in the calculation the the uh, scale effects the supply chain effects in particular so, so so china has in many areas supply chains that other countries don't don't have yet um, so so there you you basically level out a lot of the cost we have calculated that about 30% probably of China's exports are susceptible of potential to, to, to potential uh, um, you know, relocation. Uh, in terms of jobs over a number of years in our calculation, that means about six to 10 maybe million jobs that could migrate. Now, and then it depends on, on who, whom you listen to, right? I mean, if you listen to Vietnam, they will say this is a big number, it's very, very meaningful. If you listen to China, of course, in that context uh, is not as big. Um, yeah, so we we, uh, we should uh, leave it in proportion. We have also noticed on China, and to, to address maybe first question, or one of the questions we had here on, on Biden, what, what, what's going to happen to US-China. A uh, very interesting anecdote I share with you. We just, we just checked this recently. So if you compare exports out of China to Europe from, from before all these trade tensions starts to now, they're down. Interestingly, though, if you look at what the China exported to the US, back then and what they're exporting now, they're up. Uh, so, so, so much for that um, logic that the tariffs uh, mm -hmm. you know, moved, moved the needle on that they didn't actually. So four points here, what, what might Biden do? Uh, number one, uh, we think uh, he's, he's uh, gonna introduce a new part of the equation, which is human rights. It wasn't really on the table before, but we think it's important to him. Um, will he rewind restrictions or, or tariffs? Uh, probably not. Politically, the landscape is not uh, in favor of that in the US. We know that. So, so you know, he probably might not introduce additional ones, but, but not reversing the ones that exist. Also, probably more than a unilateral approach, trying to use allies to, to, to push China or not China into certain behaviors that they think is appropriate rather than going it alone. And um, yeah, so, so um, he, Hang on, the last one I had here was, um, oh yeah, TPP. Mm -hmm. um, TPP, uh, this, this uh, um, trade agreement, um, will he join? Well, he has voiced before that he would like to in a, in a different uh, context if, if, if it gets uh, sort of remodeled. But again, here the, the political landscape, even in his, or especially in his party, is probably different. So also, also here, don't hold your breath. Uh, we don't think it's happening anytime soon. Very interesting, and thank you for sharing. So that is that is uh, what you did in terms of studies, and I think uh, there is a new, uh, there is a new regime now with with the new administration in the U.S., and that certainly will, as well, um, um, have some impacts on this uh, U.S.-China uh, economical uh, conflicts. Um, so thank you for sharing those um, remarks. Maybe I don't know if if there is something you can show if our members then in written as well if somebody is interesting interested in that. So maybe you, you could uh, reach out to our office uh, and we see together with you best. But I think that's a very interesting topic. Before I come to the last question, and I then, um, so thank you very much for, for bringing that up. So there's a lot of, about China, about the US. It is a lot about um, uh, digitalization technology, uh, which, uh, which our members are interested in. And uh, as well in terms of uh, alternative energies, uh, water resources and so on. So these new te technologies um, so that uh, we can bring there maybe some thoughts up as well when it comes to the last topic. And the last topic which I want to raise in the uh, coming five minutes before then this hour is already over. I would like to ask you, dear panelists, um, one after the other, how are you investing? Since we have a lot of investors and you are all chief investors and investment officers, how are you personally investing your money now, actually, when based on all this conclusion which we did discussed today? So I let the panel open. Everybody has to give an answer. Who wants to start, please? Okay, I'll start. <laughs> Hard question. Um, in terms of my investments, uh, considering what I mentioned, which I, I truly believe in, I, I have a high allocation to equities for me, which is about 50% of the portfolio, and that's a mix of Swiss, uh, US, emerging, Japan, with an overweight in energy, 
cyclicals and industrials, which I think of this recovery story is going to be important for that sector, and an underweight in financials, and an overweight in consumer and pharma, sorry. In bonds, U US investment grade but under five year, US high yield, stuff which isn't too sensitive to, to higher long-term rates, uh, some emerging market bonds as well, and Chinese government bonds as well. So I think at 3.2%, they're yielding, 10 years yielding quite a lot more than many others. In terms of currencies, I still hold the US dollar. It's a, it will benefit if there's a risk off, if I'm wrong. Uh, Swiss franc, of course, Chinese currency, Sing dollar, and Euro. Thank you. <laughs> Who's next? Yeah, I will, I will play the game and answer this very personal question, but I must say that yeah. I manage my own assets, or actually I don't manage my own assets because my own assets are split into two components. One which is purely uh, illiquid, which is real estate, mostly in France, my uh, country of origin. So uh, uh, very liquid assets, protecting against inflation again on the long term, even if I don't fear inflation too much, as many probably understood. Um, the second part, uh, liquid assets are only and exclusively outsourced uh, 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 into DPM products. Uh, first, because I don't have a lot of time to manage by themselves, and more importantly, because I want to uh, stay away and to keep my emotion away from uh, 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 that kind of uh, management. I want to remain as diversified as possible, and uh, again, not to interfere with my own emotion in managing this part of my, uh, my assets. All right, and since since you are the chief of those uh, portfolio managers, you have then again some it's the kind process of I, I supervise. That's true, but again, my views are not interfering with that process because it's a systematic process on that specific product. All right, thank you. Right, press. Uh, maybe I go next. Um, the the I, I think uh, UK right UK has been an underdog for stock market in particular, and, and as well as the pound for actually for years, and we all know why. Because Big reason, not the only one. Big reason was was Brexit, right? So they more or less have solved that now, finally. And and actually, uh, uh, UK assets starting to outperform recently. But uh, you know, after multiple years, uh, it's, it's unlikely that after three three months, this is already stopping here. So and and then anybody who likes the income, right? Many of our investors do. Uh, UK has about the highest uh, dividend yield you, you can find anywhere. So that's one and the other one here in the region, China. I mean. Some of the large internet companies, I mean, they, we, we rarely see them so cheap, right? And, and, and um, regulation is something that hits them about every other year, sometimes three years, right? And everybody gets nervous. Do they want to destroy that company? Of course they don't, but they, we just talked about it. I mean, they have that tech competition with the US going on. The last thing you want to do is as a government to take out your, your most, your leading uh, internet company. So also worth a look. Thank you, Marco. You Yes, I, 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 I can give you a very short answer. So I'm uh, extremely boring and conservative in the West when it comes to my private um, investments. And uh, that's, that's all I can say. So nothing spectacular. All right. So, uh, but even though we can say, so we saw equity, property, UK, China, um, um, it's kind of a risk on, but it's it's uh, I, I well noted as well that nobody talked about Bitcoin and their um, own investments. So that is uh, maybe as well something which is interesting. So thank you very much, dear panelists, uh, for for sharing uh, your views. I think uh, we uh, could touch a couple of things but not everything, one hour is not too long and there are so many topics to rise. But nevertheless, I, I, I wanted to have kind of a diverse um, a view as well a bit and I hope that, and I think that uh, really uh, we achieved, we got a couple of opinions which are playing in. Hopefully we could answer uh, most of the questions. We will afterwards uh, from with the office check if the questions are really answered, we, if not, then I, um, we will be so free and come to our experts and ask them maybe uh, to give the answer written so that we could uh, will um, um, uh, fulfill the expectations there. With that, we are exactly um, done with the time. Thank you very, very much for uh, participating as well to the audience. Thank you very much for um, um, your questions. And um, I wish you all the best. I wish you good.
good luck when it comes to your economical decision, when it comes to your investment decision. And if you need some experts, I'm sure that our um, um, fellow partners from Lomba, from UBS, or uh, as well Rachi from um, uh, Deep Learning Investments uh, will, will uh, be very happy to um, uh, assist. With that, thank you very much, and I wish you all a nice evening.